Paul's letter to the Romans, <clears throat> some of the loftiest literature in all of Scripture. The ideas are broad and rich, touching upon the universal, but also encompassing the smallest matters of interpersonal relationships between two individuals. Needed to address that kind, or uh, needed those lofty ideas because there were some real challenges in the church in Rome. The church there had experienced whiplash of dramatic change. Under the time of Nero, Jewish people had been banished from the city, but by the time of this writing, there was a suspension of that policy. Jewish people were making their way back in to the city and back into the church. Their return created some pretty big questions, like how did they, excuse me, how did they fit in the church that although it emerged from a Jewish faith by now in Rome, had taken on a life of its own without Jewish influence? How did they become a multi-ethnic church once more? Paul's answer in the letter to the Romans is very brief, in a very brief and simplified form is this recognition that Jewish and Gentile people alike are trapped and need help. And that there's no law, there's no action, there's nothing that can set people free on their own. But in Jesus, God's righteousness and justice are fulfilled. And in Christ, Jewish and Gentile people alike find fellowship, redemption, and community. In Christ, a whole new kind of community is formed, and it becomes a place where there is space for both. The new community in Christ celebrates difference, and the unity is flexible enough to still hold it all together. And the unity and diversity matters for how the church conducts itself as members in the same body together, but also it's important for how we witness to the watching world. With all of that context, and we just blew through chapters 1 through 11 of Romans, it's no wonder that chapter 12 and the chapters following lay out a way to sustain that kind of community with those kinds of challenges and that kind of possibility. As Pastor Christina from Nourished shared so nicely last week, what follows in Romans 12 is a call to transformation. She said it's nonconformity to the world's messages the Apostle Paul lifts up in our uh, scripture text. She continued to say, and nonconformity is hard. Amen? Yeah. Truly being part of Christ's body is to take up the call to resist the world's ways and to accept a new kind of way of living in this new kind of community. A way that at every point is to be marked by genuine, non-hypocritical love. Genuine love that is recognized in mutual affection, in showing honor to one another, rejoicing in hope, offering hospitality to the stranger at our door, celebrating and mourning, with those who are celebrating and those who are mourning, respectively. Even blessing those who would mean us harm, and so on and so forth. Paul lays out a beautiful picture here. And yet, I'd like to uh, explore the cynics question for just a moment. That all sounds nice and good, this call to genuine love. And it's not so surprising, but if we might indulge the cynics among us, because I'm guessing there's more than just me in the room who has some questions. We might wonder, how does this overcome anything? Being nice to the enemy, 
being kind to someone who shows up at your door, showing mutual affection, all of that. The Apostle Paul said, do these things to overcome evil with good. But we're left to ask, how does that happen? These exhortations from Romans 12 can sound a bit like a message that is not about overcoming or confronting anything. It's the kind of message you might like to hear from this pulpit a little more often. Just be really nice to everyone. Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> it would fulfill all of our Iowan sensibilities, wouldn't it? Sure, let's be nice to one another. But I've watched enough nice people get trampled on by someone who didn't care at all if they were very nice. I've been nice and had the same thing happen to me. How about you? Enemies make doormats out of really nice people, and nothing evil is overcome in niceness. There has to be something more offered here. And it leads me to ask, how is it that a community of genuine love avoids conforming to this world in a way that overcomes evil? Now, it might be helpful to reframe the situation just a little bit. I'd like for us to play with an image, and this might help us understand. If you can imagine with me that evil is like a bomb set in the middle of a crowd, full of destructive power, and at any moment it can detonate and go off. When it goes off, it's going to do what bombs do. It's going to tear us apart. Metaphorically, as individuals, in our closest relationship, and through the smallest and broadest systems that order our lives. We have the knowledge, though, to diffuse that bomb. Of course, in our passage today, it is genuine love that has the power to diffuse evil. I'm not sure <clears throat> I should confess this or not, but I think Becca will be proud of me. Sometimes when I am really tired and I'm just trying to zone out, because that's what I do when I'm really tired, I pull my phone out and I go down the rabbit hole of watching reels or TikToks and, you know, it's a random assortment of things that you see as you flip through these sorts of things. But the ones that intrigue me the absolute most are these short videos where uh, someone gets out of their vehicle in the middle of a road to unleash their road rage at somebody who cut them off or, you know, whatever was the case. And I'm intrigued by the videos of the parents who yell at their child's Little League umpire or any of those cases where someone with a short fuse reaches the end of that fuse. Have you seen those videos? Maybe on the news if you don't watch TikToks. I'm a bit intrigued and I'm curious that, about the kind of pressure that someone must live under to explode in such ways like that. then I realized that, yeah, those are extreme cases. I begin to think about the kind of pressure that can build up in any one of us, and the rage and anger that can take over our thoughts. And maybe we don't hit the brakes in the middle of the highway, but maybe we do things that lets that all out. And we find in smaller ways, destruction ensues. Relationships are severed. Places of community are torn to shreds. Isolation, polarization, feelings of scarcity, the othering of people who are different than us, and so on, can be the very triggers that detonate the destructive power of evil among us. And we know that doesn't just play out on TikToks, reels. It plays out in the news nearly daily at this point with new mass shootings, wars, and other acts of violence. But on the smaller scale, 
in our daily lives. Pent-up anger can influence how we make our way through the grocery line, how we talk to our families and our coworkers, how we show up in this place and talk to one another as well. We're capable of all kinds of destructive power, aren't we? But a community of connection and care and belonging has the very power to diffuse hate among us and to make out of us a witness for the watching world. Genuine love is not just about being nice. Genuine love overcomes evil. Genuine love calls us to be something more creative, calls us to do something more creative than just seeking to squash our enemies. Genuine love makes it possible for us to be a community across differences. If evil is like a bomb ready to detonate at any moment, love always knows the right wire to cut at the right time. May your love be genuine. May our love be genuine. Amen.